this is the big parallel here, and this, this is the part that I feel very strongly people need to understand and know about. Um, so now you have the fossil fuel industry insisting that global warming isn't a problem. And I shouldn't say the whole fossil fuel industry. Obviously, there's some very important notable exceptions, but you have some members of the fossil fuel industry denying global warming, denying the scientific evidence, challenging the scientific facts. Well, of course, it's exactly parallel to what happened with tobacco, as you point out, where we had tobacco industry executives swearing under oath in Congress that there was no scientific evidence to link tobacco to cancer, emphysema, heart disease, and a host of other different problems, which in fact um, the scientific evidence had already become pretty clear by that point. Um, so when I first started studying this, I thought it was simply weird that there were these sort of eerie parallels. But then I discovered, as some other colleagues have discovered too, that it's not weird, that actually there's a direct link. And that's the really frightening part about all this. So one of the founding members of the Marshall Institute was a physicist named Frederick Seitz. Seitz was an extremely distinguished, I shouldn't say was, he's still alive, he is an extremely distinguished physicist. He was a solid state physicist. He had gotten a PhD at Princeton working with Eugene Wigner, um, one of the original members of the Manhattan Project, served on the President's Science Advisory Committee in the 1960s, became a president of the National Academy of Sciences, and then president of the Rockefeller University, which is arguably one of the most prominent scientific research institutions in the entire world. When Seitz retired from the Rockefeller University in the late 1970s, he became a consultant to R.J. Reynolds Corporation. And I'm actually- The tobacco be, company. Right, the tobacco company. He became a consultant directing a biomedical research program whose purpose was to challenge the links between tobacco smoking and ill health. And the argument that they made was that the science was unproven, that the methodologies were faulty, that it really wasn't certain, that nobody really understood cancer, uh, that there were lots of open questions. Now, this is an interesting strategy because, of course, it wasn't entirely false. There were lots of open questions. We still don't really understand the mechanisms of cancer generation. So to say that there would be more science that needs to be done is not in and of, in and of itself illegitimate. But the purpose of the program was not to advance science. The purpose of the program was not to clarify the ways in which tobacco causes ill health. The purpose of the program was to help R.J. Reynolds defend itself in court, and I have documents that show this, um, to defend itself in court by creating reasonable doubt. And so this was, in fact, an effective strategy. And again, we have documents that show that it was effective, um, or that at least Reynolds considered that it had been effective, that there were, there were suits that they won where they felt that the reason they had won was because their experts had created reasonable doubt. So, Frederick Seitz, the man who directed this program for the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, later becomes a founding member of the Marshall Institute. And one of the first things that he works on after the SDI project is global warming. And throughout the 1990s, he was the author of many reports challenging the scientific evidence of global warming, just in the exact same way that they challenged the scientific evidence linking tobacco to bad health, challenging the scientific evidence, try, trying to generate reasonable doubt. And this is the part that I found really chilling when I began reading these documents, that they never tried to claim that they had disproved global warming, because of course they didn't have to disprove it. All they had to do was create doubt, because so long as they could create doubt, they could make an argument that it was premature to pass regulatory action. Why should we sign the Kyoto Treaty when we don't really even know for sure if this is going on? But of course the problem was that we really did know I don't know if you want to say we knew for sure, but we, we, pretty, we pretty much knew for sure. The evidence was mounting. Climate scientists were coming to a consensus. Certainly there was evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that global warming was really happening, but the strategy was to try to create doubt that that was the case. 